Hi, guys. Uh, my name is Alex. I work with the Elkhorn Slough Foundation. I'm their drone technician. We started working on this project uh, maybe a year ago, and I've been working with them sort of full-time about half a year at this point. So we're still sort of in the exploratory phases, still sort of learning the capacity of what we can do with this drone. Uh, and specifically for this presentation, I'm going to talk about a restoration that we recently did in our salt marsh in Elkhorn Slough. So Elkhorn Slough, for you guys that don't know, is uh, located about two hours south of San Francisco on the California coast. It's this entire windy area in the middle that you can see in this map, uh, and then a lot of the salt marsh you can see on either side, too, all that low area between the mountains. It's one of the only salt marshes in California, so we're very lucky to have it, and we're very lucky to be able to conserve it like this. Uh, we have one of the largest resident sea otter populations. Uh, we're also a very important birding location. Uh, we were designated a globally important bird area by the American Birding <laughs> Conservancy, and pretty recently also we were designated a wetland of international importance by the Ramsar Convention on Wetlands. So it's really cool stuff, really exciting, really lucky that we've been able to conserve this area and sort of have it there for generations to come. And uh, why, why should we care about estuaries anyway? Uh, the cool thing about estuaries, well, there's a lot of cool things about estuaries. Uh, they're major carbon sequestration sites, so they take in more than their fair share of carbon from the atmosphere. They provide a lot of sediment stabilization, so they keep sediment from being swept out and eroded into the ocean. They're refugia and key habitat for a lot of really important commercial fisheries, uh, a lot of fish species, a lot of crab species. They provide a, a juvenile habitat for those organisms to grow. And then the number that you hear a lot when you're working with this stuff is they provide about $23,000 per hectare per year in what's called ecosystem services. So that's all the stuff I already mentioned, carbon sequestration, et cetera, but also things like tourism, uh, acting as a storm buffer against any incoming storms, uh, stabilizing water and water clarity, things like that. So the idea is without one hectare of a salt marsh, uh, we'd have to pay about $23,000 a year to get those same effects. But, you know, the salt marsh does it for free, so great for us. Uh, unfortunately, all our salt marshes are not in great condition these days. We're seeing a lot of subsidence, and that's something we're really worried about at Elkhorn Slough. We, we're seeing these marshes subside. We use a terrestrial laser scanner and a uh, barcode leveler to measure the subsidence, and on average, we're seeing about 2.75 millimeters per year of subsidence. Uh, couple that with, you know, a projected increase in sea level of about 1.4 millimeters a year, and we're, you know, kind of worried about our salt marshes. On top of that, uh, pickleweed, which is this big species you see everywhere in the salt marsh, is very, very important for the ecosystem. Our pickleweed sits pretty low in the tidal frame, so we're pretty worried that as the sea level rises and the salt marsh subsides, that pickleweed is going to get drowned out. This is what a drowned out salt marsh looks like. You can see pretty much the whole thing is covered with water, uh, except for a few little brown patches along some of these creeks. There's the only real spots of pickleweed here. You can see in the background, there's a lot of brown. That's what a, that's what a healthy salt marsh looks like, and that's what we really want this salt marsh here to look like, which it currently does not. Uh, so, tools of the trade. What are we using to look at the salt marsh and really get a lot of information about it? We have a Phantom DJI-4, and that gets us an RGB image. We also have a secondary Sentara camera. The Sentara camera gets us a near-infrared band, a red band, and a green band. So we can get some more information about that salt marsh, and I'll come back to that later. This is going to look uh, pretty similar to what Tim was talking about earlier, but again, uh, we use some software. We have uh, pretty much a polygon of the area we want to fly. And the cool thing about flying the same area over and over is we can just use the same polygon over and over, and everything's going to match up perfectly, and we're going to have the exact same image through time. And then when the drone is actually flying, it looks something like this. This is genuinely just a screenshot off my phone. The entire thing is automated. And every one of those little dots you see is a photo. And what the software is going to do afterwards is stitch those photos together and give us an orthomosaic of the region that we just flew which looks something like this. Uh, this is the same salt marsh I showed you a few slides ago. And again, the entire thing is green, the entire thing is subsided. You can see some ulva, which is that light green seagrass, uh, excuse me, seaweed, and then a few patches of pickleweed, which is really what we want there. 
And you can also see this line going straight down through the salt marsh. That's a berm from old land use. So as we reclaim these areas and as we really want to restore these areas, we want to remove those sorts of man-made features from our environments. And so you might say, hey, Alex, this is really cool. And I go, yeah, it is really cool. And you might say, but why not just use satellite imagery? Satellite imagery is readily available. It's great. You can do a lot of cool stuff with it. Uh, and you're totally right on that. But what I would say is the cool thing about using a drone is you get high control over spatial and temporal resolution. Spatial t resolution being uh, these images. These are like 61-acre areas, and we get resolution down to about two centimeters per pixel. So really, really high resolution. And then temporal resolution. Uh, with satellite imagery, you're sort of at the mercy of the satellite whenever the imagery is collected. But we can say, hey, you know, they're doing a lot of work today. They're doing a lot of construction. Let's fly the drone today and see what that looks like. So we can fly whenever we want and get as much information as we want. This is what the construction progress sort of looks like. Uh, we started with the subsided marsh and then filled in the entire area with about a meter of dirt pretty much raising that entire salt marsh up and hopefully giving it some sort of fighting chance against sea level rise and climate change. And again, this is what it looks like now. Uh, it's a huge area, and it kind of looks like Mars. There's not any plants on it right now. For some sense of scale, there's two tiny little dots. You can see this creek right in the front. That's my coworker and I. So this is a really, really big area really expensive restoration and all the more reason that we really want to use the best technology available to help monitor it as it's been restored. Uh, the really cool thing for me and for the work we're doing is because we're so concerned with the, uh, the z-axis, the elevation of our area, we can actually use our drone to build digital elevation models. We have about uh, one ground control point, so one elevation measurement per hectare, uh, and we fly the drone, and the drone uh, software is actually smart enough that it can say, OK, well, this is how this image looked here, and then we moved two meters over, and now it looks like this, and it can calculate elevation from that, which is so, so impressive to me. Again, you saw the photo, you know, the entire area looks like Mars. There's, you know, there's nothing there, and you can fly this drone 120 meters up and still get it's really, really high resolution. Uh, the dark blue areas are probably, uh, they're like 1.7 meters above sea level down to the yellow and the orange areas, they're about 1.94. So it's like a 20, 25 centimeter difference in the entire marsh, and we can pick that up. Uh, and already, this has come in really, really handy as we're working on our restoration. As you guys might notice, there's a sort of blue patch up near the top on that DEM. And we're looking at that in the lab, and we're going, oh, you know, it's weird that there's that blue patch there, you know? Maybe it's just some weird processing area, maybe we error, maybe there's you know, something going on, I don't know, is that a real effect, who knows? And we went out there later that day, and this flooding that you can see right there is exactly where the elevation model predicted it. And we were absolutely blown away by that. We had no ground control points in the area, we weren't measuring that area at all, and the drone alone, from 120 meters up, could see that tiny little four, eight centimeter difference and pick up exactly where we were going to see some flooding. And this is you know, all done in ArcMap, super easy, pull the elevation model in and just classify it, and that gives us that really cool information. In the future, as the vegetation comes back in, we're looking into finding some sort of automated classifier. Realistic, realistically, it would be great if we could just classify and automate the entire process. So take the imagery, stitch it, and then throw it into ArcMap and run an automated classifier. We're looking to see where the pickleweed's going to grow back and at what sort of rate, and if we're going to see any all of our other sort of plants and what those patterns are going to look like. So we're starting to look into some sort of classification to do that. Also, as I mentioned earlier, uh, we have that fourth band, we have that near-infrared band from the secondary camera. So we can do NDVI, we can uh, create indices to look at the marsh health, and we can sort of look at what the plants are going to do again as they regrow and as we start to see some natural growth in this environment. This is a flight we did at a at Cattail Marsh. This is an area that, you know, has vegetation, doesn't look like Mars. Um, and yeah, everywhere you see those green plants, it's picked up in the NDVI. Uh, unfortunately, even though this looks great, those green values uh, should be between 0 and 1, and they're reading as a negative 3. So we've still got some work to do there. If any of you guys work with a lot of NDVI, especially collecting your own NDVI data, I would love to talk to you guys about that. I'd love to swap ideas, see what you're doing, because we're still sort of figuring this out. 
So in conclusion, do we like having a drone? Yeah, we love having a drone. It's been a blast. Uh, it's super helpful, it's super efficient. We can go down there, fly the whole thing in 45 minutes. Um, we get total control over when we want to fly, what sort of data we want to collect, uh, how often we want to collect it. And then uh, my favorite part, personally, as a scientist, is like I said, you draw the polygon, you fly the drone, and the thing is entirely automated. So it really, really cuts down on any human error you might be seeing otherwise. Personally, like, like I'm all for that. It's the more automated we can get these things, the better that the science is going to be and the better the data is going to be. So that's that. Uh, thank you guys for listening. Let me know if you have any questions. <laughs>